Good afternoon and welcome to the Preservation Association of Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Burke and I'm the coordinator of these brown bags. Our lecture today is sponsored by Speedway Properties. If you're interested in these programs, you can join our membership. Um, please go to preservelincoln.org. Our speaker today is Jim McKee. Jim is a lifelong Lincolnite. His great-grandparents pioneered in Lancaster County in the 1870s. Jim has a bachelor's degree from UNL and operates J&L Lee Company, a publisher of regional books as well as the coinery. He has written over a thousand articles and books on Lincoln and Nebraska history. He's also on the Historical Society Board of Trustees and also serves on the City of Lincoln Historic Preservation Commission. And Jim was also a founding member of the Preservation Association of Lincoln. Um, this is the 28th in a series of talks. Um, and the title of the talk is, is Jim McKee's Complete History of Lincoln, and this is program number 28. Um, Jim invites you to ask questions during the program. Please join me in welcoming Jim McKee. And Jean asked me if there would be yet another program after this one. Yeah. Yes, and, and I think John said we plan on having between 12 and 15 programs total which this is 28 <laughs> and there were a bunch of unnumbered ones before that so who knows where we go uh, a picture which probably no, rem no one remembers exactly in this format uh, Bryant School or the Q Street School uh, the history goes back to 1884 when a new $4,500 building was being built at 16th and F streets the old frame building which sat on that site was then moved to 18th and Q side of this building. Then in 1886, two years later, uh, the superintendent of schools, who is Ellis Hartley, hence Hartley School um, and Dr. Hartley's properties, uh, called for bids for a new two-story, eight-room, two-towered, wood-floored building. It didn't exactly come out the way he wanted it, I don't think, uh, but in 1886, uh, this building was built for $20,000 uh, on the, be the southeast corner of 18th Q and Q. The only other thing that went along with it were two outhouses, which, are, which show up in the Sanborns map. And at that point in history, 1886, Lincoln had 16 school buildings, but you have to be a little creative in the way you count them sometimes. Uh, in 1890, what had been called the Q Street School was renamed the Bryant School, named for William Cullen Bryant, the poet, at which time the school board um, renamed many of the schools in name uh, of poets and historians and Bancroft, uh, Hawthorne, uh, and others. So in 1918, it was remodeled, and the building, as we see it here, had the tower removed. Then in 1929, the school closed. Of course, as people are moving away from that area, we see schools closing and schools moving out of the downtown core. Uh, and the Lancaster County put in some sort of a relief organization in the building. It's unclear to me exactly what it was. Uh, 1942, it became the American Legion Welfare Society. Uh, 1946, it was announced that they would remodel the building, renovate it for adult and continuing education, which is the first time I'd heard that phrase in Lincoln but nothing happened, it did not materialize. Then in 1950, it became, as I remember, it's sort of a, a ruin of a building which was used by Lincoln Public Schools strictly for storage, uh, and so it sat until 1965, 15 years later, when it was torn down. It became gravel for about two years, and then it became the site of the new Lincoln Fire Department Station Number 1, uh, which is still what it is. And if you get over there, I think they still have a museum in the building, which you can uh, get to and has some interesting things in there. A building which is familiar to all of you, although perhaps not exactly uh, in its original form, uh, it was the Nebraska Central Building and Loan Association for most of the time we remember it. In 1882, a man by the name of Morris Folsom came to Lincoln uh, he was with the Burlington and Missouri River Railroad at that time. 
uh, and then in 1884 started a real estate business at 1023 O Street, uh, which would put it someplace in the area of where the Lincoln Senior Center is today uh, on the south side of O Street. Uh, 1885, one year later, uh, it became the Bankers Building and Loan, uh, along with his brother Ernest Folsom, who joined the firm. And at that time, they moved to the east to 1130 O Street. Uh, 1901, Arnold Ricketts Folsom was born to Ernest, and he was named for his grandfather, who was Lincoln attorney Arnott Cheney Ricketts. Uh, and the Ricketts name appears quite a bit in early history. 1904, uh, the Folsom brothers hired Fisk and Demon, is that the way you pronounce it, Ed? Demon, uh, to design a new building for them at 1409 O Street, which would put it one door to the east of the southeast corner of 14th and O. And we do have a picture of the building standing there all by itself, nothing on either side of it. It looks rather forlorn. The building was completed in 1905, again almost, but not as we see it in this picture. Uh, and in 1913, they reincorporated the business, and it became at that time the first building and loan association in the city of Lincoln uh, by that name, a separate type of corporation. In 1918, uh, the building was changed to the format we see here, where originally the first floor had been set in, and it had what they called a portico, so that you would walk under... Uh, to get in the building, but they then moved the doors out to the front and increased the size of the first floor, 1918. 1970, the name was changed again to the Nebraska Central Savings and Loan Institution, at which time Arnott became the president of the association. Uh, 1959, Arnott had established the Lincoln Children's Zoo Foundation. Uh, 1970, the name was changed to the Folsom Children's Zoo. Um, 2006, they changed the name again, and Mr. Fickets, uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Folsom loses. It's now the Lincoln Children's Zoo. Uh, then, I believe it was last year, 2017, that they announced that they would be doubling the size of the Lincoln Children's Zoo to literally enclose that whole area between Capitol Parkway and A Street and 27th Street. Uh, now covering 20 acres of land, and you can drive by and watch the children's zoo changing its character completely. Uh, and now will encompass the WA, WPA building, built originally as the Ager building, uh, which was for a time completely dedicated to monkeys and for a time had all sorts of things in there. Uh, and I don't know, it was a children's playground interior for a while. Uh, the most distinguishing feature early on was when you walked inside you immediately knew that it had been a zoo. <laughs> it had certain <laughs> olfactory memories built into it, but changing completely, still there. Uh, and also, I think we'll see in the front of that, on the west of the building, uh, a resurrection of part of the remnants of a fountain, which we'll see later in the program, I think today, maybe not. This is the fraternity building uh, on the southeast corner of 13th and N Streets. Uh, which stood uh, until roughly 1926 uh, when Charles Stewart uh, and William Sharp built the Sharp Building, and which we will talk about that next. Um, but this building was called a fraternity building not because it had anything to do uh, with fraternities and sororities, but rather it was one of its primary goals was to house fraternal life insurance companies, uh, one of which Mr. Sharp was uh, uh, prominent in. This is the building which stands there today, which we recognize as the Sharp Building. I'm not sure it may have another name now, uh, but I still call it the Sharp Building. But, you know, I still call it gold, so what the heck. <laughs> and we all know where the J.C. Penney Building is on 13th and 02, but nobody else recognizes it but me, perhaps. William Sharp uh, came to Nebraska, York, Nebraska, actually originally in 1890, and there he established a fraternal life insurance company called the Royal Highlanders. Um, and fraternal insurance companies were very popular at this period in history. Uh, perhaps the one we think of first of is maybe Woodman of the World, but certainly there were a number of them that were very popular. Um, he had also at that time uh, operated a hardware store, no particular connection. Then in Lincoln, 
Uh, after the Great Depression of 1893, which was a nationwide depression uh, and caused literally uh, all of the street railway systems uh, to either become bankrupt or insolvent or at least become weakened to the point uh, where Mr. Sharp began buying them up, uh, bringing them together uh, as the Lincoln Traction Company. And at that point, he will build the uh, terminal building, which we will talk about a bit later on. Uh, terminal meaning the terminal of all of the street railway systems, not a mortuary, as some people think. Okay. Um, so, yep, yeah. Roxy. What caused that depression of 1893? You know, I don't know what caused the 1893 depression, but it was a nationwide depression. It certainly did affect uh, Nebraska, but I am not completely familiar with what caused it. It was a major depression, uh, not as great as, of course, Closer in our memory is 29, but it was a great. It was a major depression. It caused a lot of problems. Uh, anybody know what caused it? I don't know. Bank failures, I suspicion, were at the bottom of it, but I don't know. Um, a man by the name of J. O. F a. O. Faulkner, excuse me, uh, joined in um, the construction of the Sharp Building. Uh, excuse me, in the construction of the, Char uh, the, the terminal building. Then. Mr. Sharp will partner with Charles Stewart and H.E. Seidels uh, to build not only the terminal building, but also the new building here. The terminal building was most interesting of all, I think, because it was completed literally in nine to ten months. And if you, take a, if you want to take a 12-month period, they were able to tear down the buildings which were on that almost quarter of a block, probably more like an eighth of a square block, and the first tenant moved into the terminal building in less than a year. So it was an amazing construction feat. And there was, and I presume someplace, there still is a huge tablet, a brass tablet, which explains how they were able to do it. And it was done at a time when not so much uh, of it was done mechanically as it would today, but more, uh, a lot of it was just picks and shovels and human effort to build the building. That's still in the lobby. It is still in the lobby, okay. So many change, things have changed, it's almost not even to get easy to get into the lobby at certain times of the day, but uh, this huge tablet explains how they did it. So interesting. Um, 1937, the Royal Highlanders, which had moved into uh, first the terminal building, later the Sharp building, uh, became a mutual insurance company, which is a technicality, but changed completely. Uh, then in 1945, the Royal Highlanders changed their name again to the Lincoln Mutual. Life Insurance Company. Uh, but in the meantime, 1942, Mr. Sharp had died and Mrs. Sharp had sold the building uh, a couple of times. Uh, the first time she sells it for considerably less than I think than they had in the building to build it. But nonetheless, it's going to change hands and it's changed hands again. Now I think it's owned by a, a company in California maybe. And at, at any rate, the company that owns it now, I think, and I'm looking to add to nod one way or the other, I think they went in and completely tore out the rather fantastic lobby which was in there and, and reconfigured it and spiced it up, modernized it, and kind of destroyed part of the character of that lobby. Yeah, it's having little heart palpitations over here. Right? This is the Harris House, uh, and of course you immediately think, yeah, I know the Harris uh, House and I know right where it's located, but we can look back to the point where one it wasn't located where it's located now and it was actually much smaller uh, in its original conception. Uh, George Samuel Harris was the first Harris to come to Lincoln in 1872 and he too came with the Burlington and Missouri River Railroad which had been here at that point in time about two years and he was one of uh, quite a number of land agents for the Burlington Missouri River Railroad. Um, both the Burlington and the Pacific received huge grants from the federal government, state government, and smaller grants from county governments, cities, and so forth to build uh, the railroad across the United States. But most of the grants which they received were literally for land. And of course, land uh, did was important to both railroads, but if you think of these huge amounts of land, what they really wanted was a pencil-thin line through the middle of these lands, and in order to finance the construction of the railroad, they had to sell the land and use the money to build the railroad. Uh, and it seems like with the millions of acres that they had, that it would have been a tremendous fundraising device. But in fact, uh, both railroads were pressed, and at one time uh, even fell close to insolvency 
because of the amount of money it took to build the railroad. So it wasn't quite as big a gift as they thought. But it don't, at any rate, this was one of the things that uh, Mr. Harris did, uh, was sell that land through a couple primarily of land companies, which were separate corporations but owned by the railroad, Lincoln Land Company being probably the largest of them. And Mr. McFarland, who we've talked about his house last time or the time before, uh, these guys did pretty well because one of the things that they were doing was they were establishing every seven to ten miles along the railroad's right-of-way towns or sidings uh, and the town would usually consist of a siding and a depot and a water tower and a coaling station because the railroad's steam needed to be re-coaled and re-watered very frequently and every time they set up a town uh, they would usually create not just a depot, but also they would create a town, which oftentimes they named, um, and that would be a money-raising device as well, because they were able to know where the railroad was going, so with these towns, they could actually buy land and uh, prosper as the town developed. So they did very well. Mr. Harris did very well. He, he had died, however, in 1874. In the meantime, he had built, so he wasn't here very long, George, but he had built a house uh, which is described as being on the north side of K Street. The address is probably 1610, and it's probably very close to, if not exactly, on the northeast corner of that intersection, which is not where it is today. Uh, this is now a Christian church. But in the meantime, his wife, Sarah, had built a house, uh, which is described as two and a half story. Uh, actually, she had added on to a smaller house, which was there before this one. This is the two and a half story house. Uh, Sarah died in 1912, and the house then went to her daughter, uh, who very cleverly was also named Sarah. So uh, it was easy to keep track of to Sarah and her husband, the second Sarah. Um, in 1918, the second Sarah passed away and it became a fraternity house called as Alpha Tau Omega. Uh, and at that point in time, the Christian church purchased the house. Now, the history of the Christian church leading up to this is rather interesting and takes a lot of turns. And uh, I think we've covered it already, but of course they started uh, on the northeast corner of would be 14th and K Streets, uh, ultimately became insolvent. Um, and moved to, first of all, Liberty Theater and then to a couple other places before they built another church and ultimately we built a building which we know of on currently 16th and K Streets. Um, their first church building in general terms still stands and it's now a church. Is it St. Mary's Church? Was a cathedral, now it is a church, correct? Um, at any rate. Uh, the first Christian buys the church, and at that time, two of the fraternity members who were architects, George and John Unthank, both of whom I knew, uh, were sort of in charge of picking up the house and moving it um, a half an octave to the east. Uh, so it sits where it does now because they actually moved it from the corner. Uh, in 1935, the fraternity sold the fraternity house moved elsewhere, and the house was then divided into 13 apartments, which happens to old houses. Then in 1984, it was remodeled again as an office building, which it is now. Polly McMullen had the little almost attic room up on the top, which was a very interesting place. George Harris's son, to look at apart from the house, um, became the president of the Burlington Railroad in 1989. John F., another son, uh, established a New York City brokerage, um, and he was the one to whom was responsible for the ultimate building of Pioneer Park, uh, which was originally going to be called Harris Park, but through his interaction, he said, no, don't name it for my parents. Uh, instead, name it in honor of all pioneers. So it became Pioneers Park, but Mr. Harris got his name then put on the overpass uh, as, as, a, as a little extra bonus. And I don't know whether, I guess I still call the current overpass the Harris, and whether it technically is, it is it technically the horse overpass, good. It lives on in his name. One of several buildings which we think of as Curtis Toll and Payne 
uh, no relation I, that I can relate to the pain, doctor pain, of Miller and pain. It's completely separate, but frequently a question which is asked. And I'm also not clear on whether the toll uh, is related uh, to Max Toll, later the county attorney. Can't figure that out either. I'm looking to people who should know, but nobody, everybody's shaking their heads, so I can say whatever I want, I guess. <laughs> At any rate, the, building, the business rather, started in 1886 as Curtis and Vandenberg, which was actually a branch of a Clinton, Iowa firm. 1900, Charles Toll uh, moved to Lincoln and it became known not as a Toll, but Curtis and Bartlett. Uh, they at that time built two buildings, one at 300 South 6th Street and one at 601 M Street. Other buildings will follow much smaller in character. Uh, with the branches of this firm at that time, uh, they advertised as being the largest factory of its type in the United States. And that's one of those things that if you carefully define what you're talking about, you can probably be the largest in the United States. Just like everything in Lincoln for a period of 50 years was the largest and finest west of the Mississippi River or the Missouri River. Certainly every building at the University of Nebraska was the largest and finest of its type. Uh, houses, we have several houses in Lincoln which were the largest, finest house of its type west of the Missouri River, uh, which covers a whole lot of territory. But at any rate, they were the largest factory of its type in the world. Uh, the Lincoln branch of the firm uh, manufactured, they said, 1,500 glazed windows per day. Now, what does that mean? I don't know exactly either, but uh, advertising is great because, again, you can say almost whatever you want. 1906, it becomes Curtis, Toll, and Payne. And at that time, they were manufacturing and selling, um, in quotes, building paper, end of quote. Now, I think of building paper as usually tire paper or something like that, but I don't know what they were talking about as building paper. But they were also selling millwork, sashes, doors, blinds, and molding, which is what I associate their firm with. But what building paper accommodated or encompassed, I don't know. And neither do our architects, apparently. <laughs> I'm getting no help there. Uh, in 1910, a man by the name of L. O. Payne became secretary of the firm. Uh, and Sidney Payne became the supervisor um, and Charles Toll. These are the three principals in the Lincoln business. Uh, in 1915, they advertised as having branches in Sioux City, Minneapolis, Oklahoma City. However, as near as I can tell, there's still, the Lincoln is still a branch of the Iowa firm. Uh, at that time, they will build the building at 650 J Street, which we know now as Milltown, with an E on the end of it, Milltowny. Uh, in 1923, in Lincoln, they claim to have 175 employees plus five salesmen on the road, and they developed the double-hung factory glazed window. And of course, this meant that it was easy for uh, contractors and home builders to buy sort of pre-made windows that could be just set in and much simpler. Now, whether they developed that in Lincoln or not, it's unclear, but at least the firm developed them at that time. Then in 1930s, they improved it with a new double-hung pre-glazed weather-resistant window. So they keep manufacturing a little bit better product all the time. Uh, and then in the 1940s, uh, they build plants in, plants in Topeka, Detroit, New York City, and Baltimore. So the firm itself is certainly growing by leaps and bounds, but in 1965, uh, the Lincoln plant closed and the building became part of W.F. Hoppy Manufacturing. Uh, whether they took absolutely all of the buildings is not totally clear to me, but the, the major part of them became Hoppy. Then in 1966, so one year later after the Lincoln plant closed, the Clinton, Iowa factory closed which indicates to me that probably the whole uh, multi-city uh, business probably closed at about the same time. Uh, today the building we think of primarily as the Cotswold, uh, which lost two floors of its height in 1925 in a fire. In 1991 was completely uh, redone and there are other buildings within the same plot complex uh, which are primarily offices, and there's lots of different uses down there. Are, are any of them still residences? I'm not sure. I think most of them, if not all of them, are just simply um, 
offices, let's say, and, and maybe businesses of one sort or another. And the easiest way to see the two primary buildings is to take the K Street bypass, and you can lock off to the south or to your left uh, and see them very clearly. Uh, the next building is one which is I'm very familiar with as a building, and I remember it very clearly. It's not too far from where I live. This is the Sunlight Sanitarium in this particular picture. Uh, a man by the name of Dr. H. Winnett Orr, O-R-R, who was famous across the United States for uh, developing a way of pinning fractures and putting them in plaster casts. Uh, apparently, somebody had to invent it, and he had something to do with it and was well-renowned for that. Plaster cast and pin fixation of broken legs, primarily. Then, in 1908, with five others, primarily physicians, he incorporated the, incorporated the Sunlight Sanitarium for $50,000. And then at 2840 Sumner Street, uh, built this building, which was a sanatorium, sometimes sanitarium, but usually sanatorium, uh, with a $20,000 a 20, building. So apparently the $30,000 of it went into equipping and so forth. This would be on the north side of Sumner. Now it's all residences, but I remember it quite clearly it was this building. Uh, it had a balcony which faced towards the south. So we're looking at the south elevation of the building here. Uh, the building not very tall, but it also had an elevator. And they advertised Turkish mud, comma, needle spray and salt glow baths. Maybe not all at the same time. I don't know. Sounds like a treat, whatever it was. Uh, and they also advertised that they had all of the up-to-date paraphernalia, and that, whatever that means. Uh, about 1918, uh, the sanitarium closed and it became the Martin Luther Seminary, uh, at which uh, they trained primarily German-speaking Lutheran ministers. 1918, an interesting year to be doing that. Uh, 1930s, it became a private home. Uh, belonging to Fred and Martha Wick, W-I-C-K. It seems like it would have been a bizarre single-family home, but there it was. 1945, uh, which if you remembered it all, is probably how you remember it as a cavalry, cal excuse me, Calvary, I got my tongue caught there, Lutheran school, which about 1978 was raised, and it's just apartment, or houses now. You can't, you cannot, it's seamless, you can't tell where it was. Oh, I was looking at the picture and I thought, what on earth is that? Because it is not a picture of a building at all. Um, this is the Supreme Court for tractors. I don't have a good picture of the initial building. In 1915, tractors were beginning to replace horses in farming in the United States, and in fact, all over the world. In 1916, a man in Nebraska by the name of Wilmot Crozier, uh, W-I-L-L-M-O-T, Crozier, purchased a Ford Model B tractor. It was advertised as a 16 horsepower tractor which would pull two 14 inch plows at a cost of $350. According to Wilmot, it didn't. Uh, World War I, however, stopped the production of tractors briefly. And then after the war, uh, tractor manufacturing picked up instantly and within months, there were over 100 manufacturers in the United States of tractors. Um, Crozier, at this point in history, has become a Nebraska senator, state senator. And with a man by the name of Charles Warner, they got a law passed which said that any tractor which was sold in the state of Nebraska had to be officially tested before it could be sold in Nebraska. So the University of Nebraska's Ag Engineering Department, in conjunction with the Lincoln Street Railway, or the Nebraska Street Railway Commission, uh, established a building on East Campus, which in 1920 was up and going and actually tested 68 different models of tractors. Six of those 28 had to lower the speed which they advertised, 11 of them had to lower the horsepower, which they advertised. 11 made significant changes. Three just gave up and quit selling tractors in Nebraska. 
1921, the state of Nebraska instituted a fee of $250 for testing tractors, so a year later they figured out there's money to be made. Uh, and in 1980, a new building replaced the 20 or 1920-era temporary building, which I do not have a picture of. Uh, and now we have on the campus over there the Larson Tractor Museum which is addressed at 35th and Fair Streets, which runs into the campus. So when you're over visiting the Quilt Museum and you are bored to tears with quilts, as I have found myself, Linda and whoever she has with her will stay in the Quilt Museum and whoever is with her and I go to the Tractor Museum. It's only a couple blocks away, a nice easy walk. And Fair Street, of course, Originally, when we see that street today, we can't realize, but originally that connected to the state fairgrounds, to the original entrance before it was moved down to 17th Street. So, a good chance to see Fair Street. Not much else on Fair Street either. School. This is not what I thought it was, but I, is that Longfellow School? Longfellow School, I think it was a brick building. That's the first Longfellow. This is Longfellow? Okay, and I apparently, I thought I had a picture of Longfellow in here, as I remember it, a brick building, but this is the predecessor of it. Uh, now, when the plat of the original city of Lincoln was drawn, 1867, uh, it had sites for a lot of things set aside, like common schools, and this is one of them at First and K Streets. Um, and that's originally, it was known as the K Street School, but quickly became known as the Longfellow School. And I'm, I'm not sure that the frame structure was known as Longfellow, but at any rate, it is that school property. Uh, original built uh, here, then it was replaced with the brick building that I know, apparently 1890 or thereabouts, be, because it's gone by 1930. It, it, it was in the floodplain and got flooded badly. It was about 1918 building, but it didn't last long so flood damage. Okay, uh, Ed is uh, talking about the fact that because it sat in the floodplain, it was several times flooded. In fact, I know a couple of times they were taking people by boat up to park school, uh, and this was underwater and was replaced then 1918 with the brick building, which only lasted until 1930, so 45, 50 years that building was gone. And that two-story brick building, which we have quite a few pictures of, and I did not unfortunately get them in here, is the building which you might recognize. And it, it had a resemblance to other rectangular two-story plus basement brick buildings in the city of Lincoln. Um, so this building was torn down in 1931, replaced with a brick building. Uh, and I think the brick building also suffered floods, from the way I understand it. And, and now what sits on that property, I'm not sure if anything does, but it's, it, there are some houses down there very close to it, but of course there's very little need for a school either. Back to the Seidels family. <laughs> Frank A. Seidels, and Anne will raise her hand and correct me as I go, because I get the Seidels family a little bit confused sometimes. Frank A. Seidels came to Lincoln in 1874. Anne's nodding, she remembers it clearly. Uh, he sold sewing machines. Okay. Then in 1976, he moved to Bennett, Nebraska. Uh, 1889, Harry, a son, graduated from the University of Nebraska. And in 1895, uh, he also went to Lincoln High School, by the way, and then the University of Nebraska. I don't think he graduated, though, but at any rate, he attended the University of Nebraska. And then in 1895, left to open a bicycle, sporting goods, and phonograph store at 1319 O Street. So this would put it on O Street between 13th and 14th on the south side of the street. 1899, uh, he builds a auto parts store near 14th and P. Uh, the address would lead me to believe that it was east of the corner of 14th and P, not on the corner. Then in 1900, he acquires with Charles Stewart a Cadillac franchise. Uh, for the city of Lincoln, uh, and the pair of them then underwrite the General Motors payroll. And I think we talked about this last time, uh, so I won't go into details on that. But General Motors was at that time what we would call a fledgling incorporation of Pontiac, Chevrolet, Oldsmobile, 
Buick Cadillac. They were adding them, but unfortunately it was the best of times and the worst of times. Uh, and in order to meet the payroll, uh, Charles Stewart and Mr. Seidel stepped up and wrote the payroll for General Motors uh, for a time. And in payment for that, one of the things they received was a multi-state wholesale franchise for uh, the Buick automobile. So they had the Buick franchise to sell at retail, if you will, in Lincoln, but they also had a franchise to build or to sell wholesale. They built first the building at 13th and P, we see here. Um, I'm going to go ahead of a, a, a octave, and I think this is the building which preceded the one on the southeast corner. This is the one I believe stood to the east of uh, the intersection. Yeah, I pushed the wrong button here. Okay. So the one on the left stood, or this building, excuse me, stood on the corner of 13th and P. Uh, they will then build a new building uh, at 13th and Q for the Seidel's Buick building. Uh, that's the building which is now uh, a company which does uh, research for hospitals whose name? National Research Corporation. National Research Corporation. Uh, part of which they use for parking garage and part of which they have offices on. When Nebraska Book Company, uh, wholesale division, first decided to move out of the property which was now where the lead center is and move the wholesale division out, leaving the retail division there, one of the places they looked at was the building on 13th and Q Streets. But interestingly enough, the building which was built to house Buick automobiles would not support books. Anne? Well, the reason you had the parking garage there is because they stored the, the cars in the upper floors. Yeah, uh, Anne is pointing out that they stored cars on the upper floor. So it was strong enough to store cars, but not strong enough to support books, which are very, very heavy, concentrated in an area space. Uh, hard to believe, but as I say, but there, but there you have it. So they did not go there. Uh, 1919, they built the 16 or the six-story building. That I'm talking about talking about. Um, then they will also. Huh, okay, this this building is the old Elks Club building, and we are looking towards the north, and we can see a crane there building the six-story building. So this is 13th Street. We're looking at the. Uh, northwest corner of 13th and P towards the west northwest or the north west north anyway towards north a little bit to the west and the building which they're going to build is this one uh, this building is extant uh, as we said um, after this building uh, is vacated it will become Western Electric which they will purchase the building uh, and be used by the US Signal Corps uh, and at that time, Seidel's will then build a new building, um, which is this building, uh, which is on Q Street and 14th on the northeast corner. There was a huge mansion on this property before. Uh, this is the building, which is still there. Now the University of Nebraska has had varying departments in there. What's there now? I don't know. When the um, University of Nebraska Press was in the building, though, uh, parts of the building, you could still find the original Seidel's Buick, then later Mowbray Buick in here. And the thing which I remember most, and uh, I obviously did not put a picture in here of it, uh, was the Man Rose painting, which was inside the showroom on the corner, which was a panorama of the United States, starting at the right with the Statue of Liberty and going across the country to the left uh, with the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, that painting, apparently, parts of it were removed and saved, but parts of it apparently were not. It was just painted directly on the walls. Uh, Mr. Manrose painted a lot of stuff in the city of Lincoln. That's one of the things that didn't last. Uh, going back, uh, they had also a used car lot uh, on the corner, which later became the uh, discount theater in the city of Lincoln. So kind of across the street, we're looking towards the southwest in this picture. Uh, Mowbray Buick is the one that sold the building to the University of Nebraska. 
Um, and it had some interesting things at that time. The painting was gone, the fountain was gone. Uh, no longer could you see the terrazzo floor, it was gone, but you still had um, a boardroom up on the kind of a balcony, which had been kind of a pied a terre, apparently, for a good many years. So interesting building, still there, now bricked in and, and resembles it only slightly. This is the construction of Pershing Auditorium. In 1900, uh, we had the previous city uh, auditorium built at 13th and M on the um, southeast corner of the intersection in 1928. We covered this some little time ago. It burned to the ground. Uh, and then it was discovered lots of, lots of problems because it was announced that they would rebuild the auditorium immediately, within months. But they discovered, uh, apparently hadn't really realized, but the fire insurance policy was owned by the American Legion Club. Uh, there was interesting problems with the land underneath it, exactly who did it belong. To. Finally, Mr. O'Shea was able to get clear title of the land and he will buy the land under it in 1930. And we now have the uh, three-story art modern sort of parking garage on the upper floors, offices on the ground floor, which used to be the bus terminal in the city of Lincoln. The remnant of that is around on the south elevation where there is still the cut where the buses could pull in. Uh, it's also where you used to be able to buy like 20 or 30 different newspapers from different cities in there, uh, and there had a great newsstand. Uh, I drift away from the subject. Uh, at any rate, 1930, Mr. O'Shea buys that property because it's obvious that uh, they're not going to rebuild it, be rebuilding the auditorium there. Uh, then in 1939, the American Legion spearheaded the sale of what they hoped to be $750,000 worth of bonds. Then in 1941, this is all going to fall about part, by the way, so uh, don't try to keep track. 1941, the city of Lincoln will purchase from the Lincoln School District the block which had housed originally Lincoln High School and its three buildings which were connected together, later ending up as only McKinley School, but ultimately it will come down to, by 1941, it will sell that property uh, to the city of Lincoln for $46,750. So the school board had that money to play with. But World War II intervened and nothing happened. Uh, then in 1950, we revisit uh, the question of where will the city auditorium be built. Uh, they were considering at that point in time three different locations, 33rd and O, uh, which is the Rogers Tract, or the Rose Garden and the tennis bubble and the swimming pool and that today. 23rd and O and 15th and N, or the, you know, in downtown. Uh, at that time, Nathan Gold was a very active and prominent member of downtown Lincoln and business in the city, and he was absolutely opposed to the auditorium being built any place except downtown Lincoln. Uh, at that time, they had an additional $1,500,000 bond issue uh, and 33rd and O Street property is approved to be the site of the new auditorium. However, a lawsuit was filed which said that the bonds as they were sold stipulated that they were for a, an auditorium to be built downtown. And I think maybe even stipulated at the old site, but at any rate downtown. And so the uh, state Supreme Court said you can't build it. <laughs> out there because the bonds were sold to build it downtown. Um, so it's going to be downtown and of course every time anything happens to delay it, the cost estimates go up. Uh, 1952, the voters turned down a $75,000 additional bond issue. 1955, even though there was great argument at the time when, that they should not build it at 15th and N because there was no provision for parking. They did. They decided to build it there. 1957, March 10, Pershing Municipal Auditorium was dedicated and puts paid to the end of what had originally been going to be called Pershing High School, uh, but was renamed Lincoln Northeast High School, 
when the city said you cannot use Pershing's name because we're going to have a auditorium, which we intend to name Pershing, that was 1940. So it took them 17 years to get it done. But, and so we ended up with Northeast High School now known as Lincoln Northeast High School. Uh, and another long story, which we, I think we have, if we, we've already told that in one of the unnumbered uh, programs, which is on the history of Bethany, Havelock, and University Place. Okay, so 1957, the new auditorium is dedicated, just in case you're getting tired of looking at that slide, uh, interior of the auditorium itself, nice color photograph showing the stage on the uh, east end of the building. Uh, the stage, uh, 763,000 piece mural is also put on, tucked onto the end of the building, 38 by 140 feet, uh, mosaic mural, tiny little pieces. Uh, the largest at then, in 1957, is the largest mosaic mural in the United States. Actually, for a brief time, they claimed it was the largest mosaic mural in North America, but it turns out that the university in Mexico City was building a new library, which had one entire side of its multi-storied building was a mosaic. So we were no longer the largest in North America, we became the largest in the United States. Uh, I don't know whether that survived or not, but certainly the mural is day by day decreasing in size as the little pieces keep falling off. Uh, and last I knew, when they still had a crew there, they were going around occasionally with a bucket and picking up the mosaic pieces which fell off the side of the building. And I thought, well, you know, there, there's something if we need money, let's sell those mosaic pieces for, you know, a buck or something as souvenirs. Uh, the one person which did not uh, bemoan the deterioration of the mural was Norman Geske. He did not like that mural exactly. What he didn't like about it, I don't know. Uh, inside the building, there was also an 80 by 165 foot ice skating rink, uh, which was refrigerated by a series of eight mile long system of pipes, which uh, circulated uh, chilling salt water. Uh, that didn't survive, though. That, that lasted only a couple of decades, and it quit working. Um, then, concepts for various and sundry uses for the uh, Pershing Municipal Auditorium were floated, but none of them came about. And lots of committees uh, sat to try and figure out what to do with the building. And I don't think anything came of any of those committees very much. Uh, I was on one of them, and it was interesting. But and we were encouraging people to come up with any idea, no matter how silly. Like one of them was an aquarium. One was uh, indoor sort of a hydroponic garden as I recall, a lot of things, but none of them came to fruition. Another schoolhouse. This one is very problematic, and Ed may be able to correct me on several points of this one. I researched it as best I could probably uh, 10 or 15 years ago. It's, it has some real interesting whiskers on it. Uh, we do know that in 1888, uh, the school board bought a small tract of land on the northwest corner of 45th and Q. No way you can find the northwest corner of 45th and Q today. Uh, you'll find in that area parking lots and apartment houses and stuff uh, in the area, but you can't find it at all. But they then moved one of the smaller Lincoln Public Schools frame buildings onto the site. Uh, now, if you look in the city directories at that time, you find an interesting thing happen. I think it's coincidental, but it's kind of interesting coincidental. And that is, there was a man by the name of Thomas Jordan, who lived, quote, east of Wayuka, end of quote, which is that site. So the name Jordan is associated with that school immediately, but <laughs> whether it's the Jordan School becomes an argument. Uh, in 1891, the Jordan School there was the smallest city school, had only 32 students, and there too it became interesting because it wasn't in the city limits. So how the city, Lincoln Public Schools, administered a school which wasn't within the city, I don't know, but there was another one uh, that was way out 
uh, to the uh, northeast of the city. So I don't know how that worked. Uh, 1903, the Jordan School closed and the lots were sold for $207. Then in 1914, the Austin Marker Construction Company began constructing the new Jordan School, as it was called, at 4605 O Street, which would now be Petco site of. Uh, on completion, however, the Jordan School was not known as Jordan, but Hawthorne School, and it was named for Nathaniel Hawthorne, because at that period the school board was instructed, maybe the school board made up the rule themselves to name schools not like the K Street School or Q Street School, but named after people. Uh, 1923, uh, Davis and Wilson will uh, design a new school building. You see here in construction uh, on South 48th Street, a couple of blocks south and 48th Street on the east side of the street. $145,000 were appropriated. And in this picture, if we look very carefully in, in part of the picture, we can see there are cows, and we can also look clear out and see just barely, you can't see it in the picture here, I'm afraid, but you can actually see Cotner University building in the picture as well. It gives you an idea of where we're looking off that direction. Then the building which had set on O Street, which was made of stucco, was painted orange. Delightful, I thought. Delightful. Why would you paint it orange? Well, it was purchased by the Nesbitt, Nesbitt Bottling Company, and one of their products was orange soda pop. Uh, that building will be torn down and a Safeway store will be built in its stead. Uh, the Safeway store will last but briefly. It will become King's Food Host's Commissary and a large King's Drive-In. Uh, King's will, of course, uh, fade away rather quickly. It will become an electronics store. And then it will become a pet store, which is today known as Petco. I think there was another name in there briefly. Um, in 2008, um, they were there was a plan to close Hawthorne School as an elementary school, uh, and today Hawthorne School is not truly an elementary school. It is a Hawthorne community. Well, what is it? Bryan Communities Bryan Program at Hawthorne. Bryan Community Program. So it's moved from 40th Street over to the Hawthorne Building, uh, and it is known as the Bryan Community School at Hawthorne. Okay. Uh, and it's an interesting building. Uh, interior, it is one of the two buildings that I know of, and maybe there's a third elementary school building in the city of Lincoln that was built with a working fireplace in the library. Uh, the other one was Bancroft School, and I'm not sure whether Elliott School had a working fireplace or not, but uh, Elliott School has some interesting similar features in those terracotta stuff. I don't know. They look like almost they were brought from someplace else, but also the library uh, on South 48th, and I think the nurse's room had pieces of the terracotta replaced in there as well. What was going on there? I don't know, and I don't know that if Ed knows, he'll have to tell us, but maybe he doesn't. <laughs> Uh, he's about to make up something. So uh, this is a good place to stop for the day and see if there are any questions. Uh, or you can tell us more about the terracotta features in there, John. According to the internet, the answer to the question she asked about the panic of 1893, 1893. railroad overbuilding and railroad faulty financing problems. Ooh, the railroads. And we talked about them a little bit earlier, didn't we? Yeah. So the, the question was uh, that uh, Roxanne's question about what was the 1893 Depression railroad overbuilding and railroad economic problems. And maybe that was the time too then that the Burlington Railroad literally was going to declare bankruptcy. I can't remember whether that was the 1893 panic or another one. Anne. And 1893 when Frank Little had the Lincoln tra uh, Railway tra Traction Company, whatever it was, and built the little Atwood house Okay, Mr. Little, the question was, Mr. Little, who built the Little Atwood House with the Depression, moved back to Akron, Ohio. Okay, that ends today. Thank you very much. <laughs>